guys, welcome back. Today I am here with my July wrap up. If you are new to my wrap ups, the way that I always do this is I start by talking about all of my stats for the month and then I talk about all of the books that I read starting with my lowest rated books moving on up to my highest rated books. About half of the books I'm going to be talking about today I did talk about in detail in my mid-month wrap-up, which I will link up above if you guys want to check that out. So for the books that I already talked about there, I'm just going to tell you the star rating and not go into detail for those. If you want to hear more of my thoughts on them, go check out that video. And I do want to note one other thing before I get into the stats. A new thing that I've started doing in July is that my patrons are entered into a raffle every month to choose a book that they want me to read and review from my TBR. The winner for July selected Gideon the Ninth by Tamsin Muir. I wanted to point out that with this one, I am halfway through it right now. I did not finish it in July. However, I am reading it. I will be finishing it soon. And you guys will be getting a complete review video for this book. So just wanted to let you know, in case there's any concern that I didn't get to this, um, I am reading it. I will be done with it soon. And you will be getting a video talking about it. Um, so far, I'm really enjoying it. Okay, with all of that said, let's get into my stats for the month. July was an interesting interesting reading month. It was really busy. We did a lot of traveling. We were in California for almost two weeks. I have vlogs for that, which I can link up above if you guys want to check those out. Um, but with traveling, I didn't do as much reading as I usually do. In fact, July was my lowest reading month of the year in terms of number of books read and number of pages read. In July, I only read 21 books, which is definitely on the lower end for me, especially given that four of those were graphic novels, which we're going to get into. In terms of pages read, this month I read 7,015 pages, which again, my averages have been closer to 9,000 in a month, so it was definitely a lower reading month for me. However, I read a lot of really, really fantastic books, and I'll talk more in detail about what my ratings were, but my lowest rating this month was only three stars, which is pretty remarkable. I read a lot of very, very high rated books, so while I didn't read as much, I did read a lot of things that I was really loving. July was also reading a lot of ARCs and a lot of books that were sent to me for review a lot more than normal. This month, 14 of the books that I read were ARCs or books that were sent to me for review. Again, that's pretty high. I think I think part of this is because I've been trying to get to a lot of books that I picked up during BookCon and Book Expo because I just have a lot on my plate right now that I'm trying to get through. I'm hoping that that will even out in the next couple of months, but I don't know, maybe part of it is just that with the channel growing, I'm having people offer me more things. I'm saying no to more things, but I'm still getting more things. So it's a little tricky. I'm still trying to work out the details of how to make that work. This month I did DNF one book, which I will talk about, and it was a book for review that was not working for me, and I had one reread. In terms of goals that I set for myself at the beginning of the year, my goal is to read an average of one nonfiction book per month, one indie book per month, and one work of translated fiction per month. This month, uh, didn't quite hit those. I did read two nonfiction books, I did not read any indie books, and I did not read any translated books. However, I do think I will be reading at least one or two indie books in August, and I'm still, I'm, I'm struggling on the translated fiction, guys. I've I've been trying, and I have read some. I've read more this year than last year, but uh, yeah, I'm not, definitely not hitting the goals quite there. Like I said earlier, four of the books that I read this month were graphic novels, and nine of them were audiobooks. That page count that I mentioned earlier does include pages from my audiobooks. So pretty typical number of audiobooks for me, especially with the traveling. That was an easy way to consume books, and that was a huge help for me. Five of those nine audiobooks that I listened to I have labeled as shelf, which means that those were books that had been sitting on my TBR shelf and I got them off of my TBR shelf via audio. In case you're interested in where those audiobooks were coming from, I decided to take a look at the stats for that this month just for in case you're curious. Three of the audiobooks that I listened to were from Scribd, three of them were from my library, two of them were from the Volumes app. That's where I get audiobooks for review from Penguin Random House, so I got two of those this month, and one of them was a book from Audible. Okay, moving on, let's talk about the age breakdown for this month. I'm really happy with it. It's about what I want to see most months. This month, 11 of the books that I read were targeted at an adult audience, nine of them were targeted at a YA audience, and one of them was targeted at a middle grade audience. I don't tend to read a whole lot of middle grade, and so this is pretty typical for me, but I like to see a 
reasonably even split between YA and adults. In terms of genre, I'm going to start with my most read genre and move down to my least read. Nobody should be surprised that, as usual, my most read genre this month was fantasy. Ten of the books that I read were fantasy books. It is entirely possible that that is part of why my ratings were so high this month. I do tend to like fantasy more, although sometimes they get rated low too. It happens. I read three romance books this month. I read three sci-fi books this month, two nonfiction, as we mentioned earlier, and then one contemporary, one dystopian, one historical fiction, and one superhero book. So a smattering of other things, but about half of what I read was fantasy. Again, this is th this is very on brand for me. Okay, moving on, let's talk about star ratings. As you will see, I had a very high star rating month, unusually so. I read a lot of things I really enjoyed, and I just didn't read anything that I didn't like. I didn't have any one stars, two stars, or two and a half stars. I had one three star. I had three books that I gave three and a half stars, four books that I gave four stars, three books that I rated four and a half stars, nine books that I rated five stars. Um, so a lot of really, really great books this month. And then one book that I gave six stars. And if you're not familiar, six stars is in my personal rating scale, what I give to a book that is a favorite of the year or a favorite of all time. So this month I had one book that fell into that category. All right, with that said, let's move on to talking about the books. And I will let you know if any of the books are books that I talked about in my mid month wrap up. And I'm going to start with my lowest rated books and move up to my highest rated books. Like I said, I had one book that I gave three stars. This is a book that I talked about in my mid month wrap up. And it was the July pick for the Patreon book club. This is The Bride Test by Helen Huang. It is adult romance. I did still like it, but it was three stars. I talked about it in my mid month wrap up. Moving on, I had three books that I rated three and a half stars. One of them I did talk about in my mid month wrap up and that is Wicked Fox by Kat Cho. If you want to hear more of my thoughts on that, check out that video. I also gave three and a half stars to Exit Strategy by Martha Wells. This is the final novella in the Murderbot Diaries, which is a sci-fi series following Murderbot, who is a biological AI. This was not my favorite book of the series, but I did still enjoy it. Three and a half stars is still a pretty good rating. I think Rogue Protocol is probably my favorite book in the series. That's book three. This is book four. There is supposed to be a full length novel coming out soon, which I'm really excited about. In general, I just love Murderbot as a character. They have such a dry sense of humor and I really enjoy the adventures, the world building. These are just perfect if you're looking for bite size sci-fi novellas. I think they're really fantastic. The audiobooks are also, I think, really good and they're very, very quick to get through. So this was one that I listened to on audio. I own all of them because they're beautiful and I just really love the series. I love all these little tour.com books. They're great. So um, yeah, happy that I finally finished that up. And this one was three and a half stars. I also gave three and a half stars to A Crash of Fate by Zoraida Cordova. This is a Star Wars Galaxy's Edge novel. I'm so happy I read this. It was really, really fun. I actually read this one with my husband in preparation for going to Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, which is the new kind of Star Wars land in Disneyland. It was so cool guys. So so cool. I have a whole bunch of videos that are going to be coming out from the footage that I got while I was at Galaxy's Edge so if you guys are curious to check that out. Some of that is in my Reading Rush vlog and then I'm working on a kind of in-depth vlog just about Galaxy's Edge and additionally because one of the really cool things about reading this was that there were a whole bunch of locations that show up in the book that we were able to find when we went to Disneyland and that was super cool. So I'm going to also have a whole video coming out where I take you to some of the locations that show up in Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. So that was really the coolest thing for me about that was kind of knowing some of the characters and some of the locations before I went. So if you're planning on going I would definitely recommend picking this up. In terms of the story it was fine. I enjoyed it. It didn't blow my mind but I did like it. it. It was not quite what I expected, probably because I didn't read the back very closely. This is actually kind of an adventure romance. So the the romance relationship really is central to the book. But it does take place on Batu, which is the planet where Galaxy's Edge is set. This one follows two childhood friends who reconnect after many years and kind of fall for each other. The bulk of the book takes place in one day. Um, so for those of you who don't like sort of that insta love type thing. 
it may not be for you because it definitely has a little bit more of that not entirely because they do have a history together but it's been like years and years since they've seen each other so there is that but it was cute it was enjoyable it was fun being in the Star Wars universe and it was really cool getting all of the details of this kind of immersive world so I did like it I'm really happy that I read it and if you're planning on going to the park I would for sure recommend picking it up. Oh, and also this is an arc of a book that is coming out in August. This says August 19th. I think it ended up changing the release date to earlier in August. So by the time this goes up, it's probably either available or about to be available. So definitely go check it out. All right, moving on to my four star reads. There were four books that I gave four stars. So two of them I did already talk about in my mid-month wrap up. The first one is after You Are Gone, We Are Here Forever by Michelle Gish. This is a graphic novel that was sent to me for review by Quirk Books. And the other one that I've already talked about is The Other Side, Stories of Central American Teen Refugees Who Dream of Crossing the Border by Juan Pablo Villalobos. This is an arc of a book that was sent to me for review by Fierce Reads. It's coming out in September and it is YA nonfiction. I also gave four stars to another nonfiction book that was sent to me for review. This is Reckoning, The Epic Battle Against Sexual Abuse and Harassment by Linda Hirschman. I actually listened to this on audio even though I do have the physical copy of it. I would recommend reading this book with a couple of caveats. I think it has a lot going for it. It traces the history of the last 60 years of the movement against sexual abuse and harassment of women and it's really really interesting if you like this sort of thing. It follows some of the court cases, some of the changes in thinking and in policy and the way that all of those things since like the 60s or so led up to the recent Me Too movement. So I think it does a really good job of tracing that. I think it's got a lot of really interesting material. I do think it's worth picking up. I will say the reason that this one was four stars for me and not five stars is that I think it's a little bit narrow in its view of things. It is not great at being intersectional. It does have some nods to black women who were foundational to some of these things happening. However, there is really no discussion of the queer community. So trans women, trans men who experience this sort of sexual abuse and harassment, or other men who also experience these things in the workplace. It is pretty much entirely focused on cis straight women and their experiences with sexual abuse and harassment and the way that those laws apply to it. So I think that is a bit of a blind spot. It's not exploring the way this, that these issues affect other communities and other groups of people. And um, so that I didn't particularly love. I also do think that the author has a very specific view of certain elements of women and women's sexuality that have been debated among feminist theorists and it, it's pretty clear which side of that she falls onto and so I think it's a little bit skewed in that way. That said, I still thought it was a really strong book. I do think it's worth picking up and worth reading but just do be aware that there are definitely some blind spots and some places that I think this could have done a better job of being more inclusive. And the final book that I gave four stars to is another graphic novel. This is Mira Tidebreaker by Danielle Page, illustrated by Stephen Byrne. Um, this was also given to me for review at BookCon by DC Comics. I really enjoyed this. It is a prequel novel in the Aquaman universe. So Mira is a princess and this is kind of a coming of age story of hers where she goes to land for the first time and meets Aquaman and is planning on killing him but then comes to some realizations about things. I really really enjoyed it. I thought it was it was fun. It was good. Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't really have anything like negative to say to it. I think it does a good job for the audience that it's intended for. This is really a YA story and it reads like that. The issues that she's grappling with in terms of morality, in terms of whether her allegiance is to her family or to what she believes is right and kind of coming of age and finding who she wants to be, like all of that very feels solidly YA to me and I think for what it is it's done pretty well. Then I had three books that I gave four and a half stars. One one of them I did talk about in my mid-month wrap-up and that was an e-arc that I had of Spin the Dawn by Elizabeth Lim. If you guys want to hear my thoughts on that, again, check out my mid-month wrap-up. I also gave four and a half stars to another book that I had for review. This is The Tea Dragon Festival by Katie O'Neill. Um, so I think I liked this a little bit less than The Tea Dragon Society even though oddly this one probably has more of a plot to it. <laughs> so I don't know why, I still really really loved it. It's super adorable. This is actually a prequel graphic novel to the Tea Dragon Society which was five stars for me. Absolutely loved it. This is middle grade but it is just super cute, 
super diverse, super inclusive. Um, I just really enjoyed it. They're so adorable. I will read more of this. Definitely read more from this author. And my final four and a half star read was one that I did listen to on audio. This is Rebel by Beverly Jenkins. Beverly Jenkins writes such great historical romance. I really, really love her books and I'm continuing to hopefully pick up more of her backlist. This is her newest book. It's the start of a new series. It is set in Reconstruction era Louisiana. Beverly Jenkins just does a great job of really integrating a lot of history in what she writes. I know she does a lot of research and she specifically focuses on the history of people of color and oftentimes history that's been lost or hasn't really been very well known. And this is another case where you're going to read a great romance and also learn a lot. And I, this is a perfect example. I really, really enjoyed this one. It follows a young woman who's gone down to Louisiana to teach English to former slaves in the Reconstruction era, and she falls for a man who is from a wealthy Creole family. And it does a really good job of exploring some of the dynamics between Creole black people who didn't necessarily want to be associated sometimes with former slaves who they saw as more uneducated and it kind of explores some of the interesting historical things that were happening in Louisiana during this time period in terms of race relations. And it's also, you know, a great steamy romance and um, I really enjoyed it. And uh, it also includes a side character who is queer and so that's kind of cool too. Including in historical romance a queer character on the page where, you know, they were really a part of the world and how they handled that during this time period. So yeah, four and a half stars for me. Really, really enjoyed it. All right, next up, let's move on to my five star reads. All of these were just so, so good. There were nine books that I gave five stars to this month, and I think like five of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap up. The first one was a reread in preparation for reading The Ark of the Sequel. This is Black Wings Beating by Alex London. This one was a favorite last year, still five stars. I also gave five stars to another graphic novel. This is Little Witches Magic and Conquered by Lee Dragoon. It is a retelling of Little Women, but with magic. It's great. Um, and then I also gave five stars to The Beautiful by Renee Audier. This book is coming out in October. It's her YA vampire novel. If you guys want to hear more of my thoughts on this, I actually do have a complete in-depth review of it. Uh, which I will link up above if you want to check it out, but I will definitely be purchasing a finished copy for myself. I also gave five stars to The Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead. Again, this is one that I did talk about in my mid-month wrap-up. The final five star read that I talked about in that video is The Wedding Party by Jasmine Guillory. I do now own my own finished copy. I listened to an audio arc of it, loved it so much that I uh, went out and purchased it. This is my favorite of the series so far really enjoyed it. All right, so then I have four other books that I gave five stars to this month. The first one is Love From A to Z by S.K. Ali. I love this. This was the July pick for the Dragons and Tea book club run by Melanie from Altiani and Amy from A Court of Crowns and Quills. I think S.K. Ali is doing amazing work. I think last year I read Saints and Misfits, which was her debut novel. That was a five-star read for me as well. And I just think that she is such a great voice in bringing representation to practicing Muslim teenagers. This is a contemporary love story between these two Muslim teens. And the thing that I love about what she does is she brings these characters to life. Like, they become less of these stereotypes and real relatable teenagers who have faith as an important part of their lives. And it's interesting to me reading this, I actually think that probably a lot of more conservative Christian teenagers would find some of these characters to be pretty relatable, and I think that that's great. I also think there's going to be a lot of Muslim teens that will really find themselves here. It's a cute story, but it does also get into more serious issues. It deals with Islamophobia, it deals with chronic illness, more specifically multiple sclerosis, and I just think it's done so well, and it it's very rooted in Islamic faith and that faith and elements of the religion are throughout the book as well but I I just loved it I think she's doing such great stuff and I look forward to reading whatever else she puts out I also gave five stars to Gods of Jade and Shadow by Silvia Moreno Garcia I did have an e arc of this and then um, I have the physical book from Book of the Month Club and it's so pretty guys it's so pretty I really, really liked this a lot. I love Sylvia Moreno Garcia's writing. I just think it's so smart and she has such beautiful prose and has such interesting stories. This one is 
really, really unusual and inventive. I think it's done so well. It's kind of a blend of historical fiction and urban fantasy. It's set in 1920s Mexico which is just not something that you really read much about. It also draws on Mayan mythology, so it's part fairy tale, part historical fiction, part like urban fantasy with this Mayan mythology and gods, and it's so good and so well done. It follows a young woman from a small town in Mexico. Her and her mother are kind of at the mercy of her wealthy and not very nice grandfather. And one day she opens a forbidden box and finds some bones that come together and it brings to life an ancient Mayan god. And then she goes on this sort of journey to help him with some various things. And so part of it is her sort of coming of age story, her finding herself and discovering herself, and I think it's beautifully done. It also really gets into colonialism and the impacts of that. It's really, really rich in the culture and the history, and it's just so good. It's so well written. I would would definitely recommend it. I loved it. I also gave five stars to a beast of a book that has been on my TBR for like over a year. I finally read The Priory of the Orange Tree by Samantha Shannon. I actually listened to this one on audio mostly. I did actually physically read some of it as well, like a pretty big chunk of it actually, as I was listening to the audiobook. So this is an arc that I had and didn't get to because it's ginormous. It's like almost 900 pages long. Um, so, huh, I ended up deciding to give this one five stars just because it's done so well. So well, and I really, really enjoyed it. The only thing with this is I think it should have been a duology or a series. Um, I, I it is a standalone. This is a standalone adult epic fantasy. The world building is amazing. The characters, the, the politics, like, it's brilliant. It's brilliantly done and the magic system and like there there's just so so much that's so well done and the yeah um that I had to give it five stars. I couldn't not give it five stars. But I do think that especially towards the end you lose a little bit of the depth that I was looking for in terms of character development and relationship development and other things that could have been explored more and wish were that got I think truncated because it was trying to be a standalone um, and I think you could definitely have more in this world so I wish this had been turned into a duology and expanded. The funny thing is is that I know for some people they think this is really boring and it's too slow for them so this is not going to be the book for everyone. I think it's absolutely brilliant but it's gonna be for people who like epic high fantasy with a lot of intense world building and multiple characters. We do have five character perspectives through here. I think they're so well done. They are very very different and I think she does a pretty good job of differentiating their voices and the types of people that they are. Um, I for sure did have a favorite but I really enjoyed all of them and I liked the way that the threads all came together. I thought it was a really interesting take on dragons. She really built out the mythology and the culture and history of different places in the world and the religion and I just I loved it. And then there's this great sort of slow burn romance that develops as well which isn't like the main point of it but it's part of it. I, I mean it's really really good. It's really really good. Um, I think if it wasn't a standalone this easily would have been like a favorite for me and I may still end up making this a favorite of the year just because it's so brilliantly done but I know for some people it's going to be slow like it's this very there is a solid plot to it but it is definitely more driven by the characters and more driven by the world building so I can understand why some people might not enjoy this that much but yeah I loved it a whole lot. My final five star read of the month is a book that I did as a buddy read with Melanie from Melt Fanny and Jocelyn from Yogi with a Book. All of us liked this. I think I probably liked it best of all of us and I'm going to talk about why I think that is. This is a debut novel coming out in September. It is The Ten Thousand Doors of January by Alex E. Harrow. Um, so first of all, I mean, can we appreciate the cover because the cover is absolutely stunning. I loved this and I think there are people who also will love this. I also don't think it will necessarily be the book for everyone. I mean, which I think I say about a lot of things, but but while Melanie and Jocelyn both liked this, for them I think it was more of a four star read and for me this was a five star, maybe six, it could be, I don't know, I'll have to like sit on it and see how it sits with me, but especially teenage me would have 
been completely obsessed with this book and read it and reread it. As it is, I still really loved it and could see myself rereading it. This is adult portal fantasy. Some people might think it's YA because the main character is younger and it is partially a coming of age story, but I definitely would call this adult. I mean, I think teenagers could certainly read it, but it's not written for that audience, if that makes sense. It's set in early 1900s America and it follows a young woman who is the ward of a wealthy man and she is, grows up with him while her father, who works for him, travels the world finding oddities and rarities for his collection. January is the main character. But January finds a door that leads to another world and then she finds a book called The Ten Thousand Doors that talk about these doors to other worlds that explore their history and their properties and stories about them. And so when she starts reading this book, it becomes kind of a story within a story with alternating chapters from different perspectives. I really enjoyed it a lot. I loved both of those two things and I liked how they kind of came together and worked together. So this is a very sort of magical story. Some of it does read kind of like a fairy tale, but the writing style and the reason I think the writing style really worked for me is it reads to me a lot like Victorian literature. The style of writing that the author uses is very reminiscent of Victorian literature and I think that might be part of why Jocelyn and Melanie didn't get along as well with it. Maybe, I'm not sure if that's why, but it seems like perhaps the prose is really, really beautiful, um, but they felt like they couldn't quite sink into the story, and I think that might be why, but I get along better with that style of writing, and I really loved it. Also, this book is so, so rich thematically. It's really interesting, and I liked the way that she sort of did different things with these traditional tropes that we've seen. Some of the themes that this deals with are racism and multiracial identity and the ways that those things intersect with gender bias, class bias, wealth inequality, um, and multiple other things as well. And I think it's so well done and so interesting the way that that's woven in. January is of mixed race background. She's described as having copper colored skin. Her father has much darker skin than she does. And it's interesting the way that it explores the differences in the way that she and her father are treated depending on geography of where they are, depending on whether they appear to be wealthy, depending on how they're dressed or are not. And it's it's really, really good. It's really well done. And it explores also some of these like wealth inequalities and it's about privilege. And um, yeah, I loved it. I thought it was really, really good. The writing itself is beautiful. This is one I for sure could see myself rereading. And I also may end up bumping this up to a favorite of the year. I don't know. These are like, okay, so like, and I, these are the two books that I've read this month that I'm on the fence about that I'm like, are they five stars or are they six stars? I don't know yet. I'm just gonna sit on it and wait and see. But both of them are, are so good. I think if those sound appealing to you, the style sounds appealing to you, I would definitely recommend them. And the final book that I read this month, I did definitely give six stars to, absolutely loved it, and I did talk about it in my mid-month wrap-up. This is Grey Sister by Mark Lawrence. This is the sequel to Red Sister. I loved it even more than the first one. Um, so, so good. So, so good. Can't wait to finish up this trilogy. Hey guys, editing Bethany here. I realized I forgot to do a couple of things. First of all, I forgot to talk about my DNF that I had this month, which was The Love Solution by Ashley Croft. This was an adult romance e-arc that I had for review. For me, I just kind of had issues with the power dynamics of one of the main romantic relationships involving a boss and an employee that I don't think was handled in a way that I was super comfortable with, so I decided to DNF that one, um, which is unfortunate because I kind of liked the premise of it. I always like things with women in STEM. I think it's cool, but um, yeah, not for me, so I DNF'd that one. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is I did participate in a couple of readathons in the month of July. The first one was The Reading Rush, and if you guys want to hear my wrap-up for that, check out my Reading Rush vlog, which I will link up above. Um, I do talk about the books that I read in there and then wrap it up at the end of the vlog. And then I also participated in Medievalathon, which was hosted by Holly Hart's Books. So that was super fun. And I did really, really well, actually. I ended up as a queen with a full suit of armor and like most of the weapons. So that went quite well. I maybe I'll put like a little thing on the screen here so you can see the books that I read and what challenges they fulfilled for Medievalathon. But yeah, I wanted to hop on here and update you guys on that.
back to what I filmed earlier. So there you go. Those are all of the books that I read in July. As you can tell, even though I didn't read as many books maybe as I usually do, I'm really, really excited about a lot of the books that I did read. So many good things from so many different categories. Um, yeah, it was a really good month. So talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything that I read or talked about. And for your question of the day, tell me about a trope or a writing style that you really enjoy that not everybody does. Because I think I've talked a little bit about that here, like books where it really works for me but might not work for everyone else. So tell me about something that you feel that way about in your reading something that you love that some people don't really enjoy as much let me know your thoughts if you guys liked this video give it a thumbs up subscribe if you want to see more thank you so much for watching and i will see you next time